Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of The Legal Beagle. Today we're talking with Kate Prowse from Oxford City, Ohio, where he's had a lot of trouble with municipality, both damaging his property and keep it, preventing him from right to assembly. He's filed two different federal lawsuits that we're going to get into today. And without further ado, here's Tate. Hello. What's up, Thanks Tate? For- What's going Thank on? Much, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. I, I've waited this for for a while. I feel honored to, to be second to Alphonse. So. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody's ranked here, but uh, <laughs> we, we are all getting knowledgeable and can talk about our cases and we need to start publicizing these things. So um, what what do you want to talk about first? Well, why don't you give us a little rundown of both cases and then um, we'll go into specifics and pull up some graphics and, and, and your documents you've sent me. Okay, great. Yeah, the first case that I filed, it was November of 2022 and it revolved around both cases are for the city of oxford as you said the first case revolves around a mass gathering ordinance which was uh wrongfully enacted you know it's a basically it's a creation of police power that the city of oxford does not have the power to enact on their own and not only that or restrict mass gathering though both those words are synonymous with a bridge piece of the assembly, which is one of the five freedoms in the First Amendment. So to limit gatherings or to abridge assembly, it's the exact same thing. So the argument that I made there is that during the holiday season of 2020, my family and I were unwilling to gather during those times, which is true because of the madness that was going on in the city of Oxford. So appealing, I've appealed it to the Sixth Circuit. It's now fully briefed. The opponent, opposing counsel has requested oral argument, which is a play out of my book, which I requested oral argument earlier in the fall for that case uh, to speak in front of Judge Cole. So essentially the magistrate interestingly ruled that I had standing in that case, but then she did bend over backwards and quite a number of gymnastics to essentially dismiss everything else. So I opposed that ruling, obviously, with a Rule 72. Then we, I requested an oral argument to talk in front of Judge Cole, and he made his order uh, a couple months later that dismissed the case, said that I did not have standing. I, fi- I filed the objections to that. I think it was a Rule 59 slash 60 is how I, he then, I knew that I was just buying myself more time. I knew that there was, you know, he wasn't going to overturn his own ruling. But and who, who appointed this judge? Trump. He's a Trump appointee. So I had high hopes for him. I still pulled out some. I, I feel, frankly, and I called him out on this, I called it poltroon, which is cowardly. I feel that it was a, he took the cowardly approach, did not want to rule on the merit. Really difficult questions that I'm posing regarding and revolving around municipalities in Ohio. And what they are getting away with is stunning par for the course for all of us. But he ruled that I didn't have standing. So <clears throat> that's been appealed to the Sixth Circuit. And we are, I would assume the next thing that I'll get from them is either approving or either you know, agreeing to defense counsels or appellees, I should say, uh, a granting their request for oral argument, which would mean that I would have to go in front of the Sixth Circuit. Fun, it's a cool prospect, but it's also quite nerve wracking at the same time. I actually hear a lot of lawyers brag about being able to go to the appellate circuit and argue there. That They put that on their resume. So look at it as a bad badge of honor. I will, and I think it's kind of cool. I kind of like that. So the opposing counsel, obviously we were all experiencing very similar things in regard to, he at least stayed inside the four corners, which I can, you know, obviously that's a good thing, but my goodness gracious, it's the same exact situation that Alphonse has been talking about where 99% of the cases that he cites as his precious case law, which is, it's as if case law to him is the most important thing in the world. Case law, case law, case law. So all of his case law is nothing but legal entity versus legal entity. It's administrative law 
That's all it is. Creature statute versus this city. Creature statute versus this entity. And, and it's it's not at all the same thing as what I'm putting forward. So that that's that's been frustrating to deal with. Uh, and he's he's sly, he, scummy. And I don't want to deride him because I don't. You know, but it, that's just how I view it. It's bush league tactics. It's it's underhanded. It's just it's dishonest it's everything that we've come to expect in the law profession so well we we've caught a couple of magistrate a couple uh u.s attorneys assisting us changing conjunctions in some of the case law so it means hmm. something different and we pointed this out judge doesn't care of course but uh we we don't even have we have one of these liberal judges, you know, so it's it's probably worse off than your situation. But let's yes. go back and would you talk a little bit about standing and tell us why they're trying to remove that from you and what that means to to the case? Sure. So in order to present a case or controversy in a federal court, you have to have article what's called Article Three standing. So Article Three standing essentially requires concrete and particularized harm. Uh, so uh, your case, for instance, you get pulled over, they search you, they seize you, they take your property. Those are pretty concrete and particularized harms. Whereas what I'm arguing, a chilling effect of one's First Amendment right is more etheric. It's not, it's, 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 it, they started to give a brief history. Uh, the, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s is when they really, the, the jurisprudence really was created for this. And essentially it revolved around, the first couple of cases were revolving around loyalty oaths that public universities, public entities like schooling systems were making their employees requiring their employees to sign pledges of, you know, they're anti-communists in nature. So the argument was made that this had a chilling effect on one's ability to speak freely, on one's First Amendment or one's freedom to associate. Um, and eventually the jurisprudence has built. And now, in my opinion, this case that I'm arguing is the most egregious chilling effect that's, uh, that I can find. Uh, with one exception, however, that was a case called Coach Bra. I'm so I'm getting off of the standing, and I tend to do that. But so, uh, in order to find yourself in federal court, you have to have a case or controversy of a particularized concrete harm, and it was ruled that I did not have that uh, for various reasons that are. If we wanted to get into the specifics of chilling effect, that be you know be, we could do that uh so would you yeah yeah let's ab absolutely talk about that i saw some case law you cited that uh brings in the chilling effect and shows that you do have stand standing if you were uh scared to do something as a police threat coming at you and so let's let's talk about that and anytime you want to pull up any of these documents let me know we'll we'll make it happen sure yeah, I mean, if you wanted to pull up, I guess, either one of the, either my appeal brief or the reply. So some of the cases, like I said, the, the there are several that I'll just give a brief summation of. One's called Baguette v. Bullet. It was a Washington, case out of Washington in the, you know, it went to the Supreme Court. And it was a group of teachers, Washington teachers, that did not want to sign this loyalty oath. And it was also students, University of Washington students. They were granted standing. So they weren't even, there was no threat for them to even have to sign this oath. It was just the Supreme Court allowed them to also have standing in that case. So that was, once again, a loyalty oath surrounding, you know, essentially a, a communist type. Uh, loyalty oath. <laughs> Washington's now a bastion of, it's interesting, some, some of the states that have these loyalty oaths, New York, Washington, California, go figure. Now they're bastions of, you know, fascism, communism, whatever you want to call it. So maybe these, those, those loyalty oaths were 
needed. Uh, so another the chilling effect case, Meese versus Keene. This was a California senator that wanted to show videos. They were about like acid rain and climate things, climate issues. This was back in the 80s. But these were videos from, Can they were like movies from Canada. And there was a particular United States code <clears throat> that prevented foreign propaganda or something along those lines. And so he challenged that statute. And the, these were up, this was upheld by the Supreme Court. Would so, that be the Smith-Mont Act? I, I don't think it was, but it might have been. It was no, it was it was, it was much older. <clears throat> this was, I want to say, it was a 1930s or 1940s. I don't know. I don't depend on maybe that's when the Smith Month Act came into being, but it wasn't that. It was some other foreign uh, propaganda video act. It was a, a you know a congressional act. So this was a law that was in place that he claimed was chilling his ability to show this film in some you know group setting that he wanted to do <clears throat> so i mean come on when it comes to like that was upheld that we're talking about filing you know some movie about acid rain this is my right to peaceable assembly it's a far cry different so there's another case uh coats v city of cincinnati so this one is a big one this actually wasn't a chilling because they actually arrested people in cincinnati for violating this ordinance the ordinance was no, three persons, uh, no more than three persons shall be able to gather together in the, the on the streets, the alleyways, and thereby annoy other persons. So student protesters, I guess, annoyed people on purpose, and they got arrested for this. So this went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it was overturned. I mean, it, it's just an absurd thing. And interestingly, the Supreme Court's, uh, the Supreme Court's opinion said people three people but the ordinance says person so that's when you get into the obfuscation of the statutory construction and when you start you know going through those nociter socius ejusum generis uh espressio unius you know est the exclusion uh, canon of construction where you read the definition of person and it's a whole bunch of corporate entities does that 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 not it's not game over that's that's just one of those pebbles that we need to be using in our filings and needing needing to understand better is how these statutes codes oftentimes don't apply to us not all the time and i think that's an interesting thing just a tangent off of that your state louisiana that criminal statute you can't get around that any any human being from uh, fertile, the moment of fertilization until implantation is how the, the Louisiana legislature has determined their criminal statutes. Not arguing that. Um, so anyway, getting back to the chilling effect, uh, essentially, I don't know where, where, where was I? I really don't recall. Well, let's, let's talk about the, uh, uh, the word person, right? I think that's where we were going to define that. Now you have that here, um, I believe. Yeah, that should be in my appeal brief. <clears throat> so, yeah, so this is the original one. I think it's in there. Yeah, so I, I think you have it right here. I see the person within the city's codified ordinances is defined as person. It includes an individual, corporation, business, trust, estate, trust, partnership, and association. So so explain to us what why that can't pertain to you. Sure. Well, clearly, <clears throat> it's individual followed by an enumeration of legal entities trust llc partnership association I, i'm not any of those things obviously so you will you must be you're an individual then okay so we use our rules of statutory construction this one no satirosis would apply words of a feather flock together as i believe justice scalia 
eloquently put it. Uh, and then, so you take it's an ambiguous word. It's not defined with it, but it is defined within person. So that's what they're using to have all, their, all of their codes and ordinances are applicable to persons. You read the city of Oxford's codes and ordinances, every single one, no person shall do this, any person doing this. And then it defines that, that, that phrase. So individual is a nebulous term and it is given its association by those other words within it, within that statute. So uh, Alphonse has also put forward a couple of really good uh, case law things for, I think is Bouvier's dictionary that talks about a, you know, an individual or a natural person. Usually they're one and the same. Uh, the IRS code, I think that's another big one where the IRS goes into great detail on what an individual is. And it's something like a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a stenographer, uh, you know, a, a veterinarian, human somebody beings. in commerce. Sure. Well, yes, more often than not. Yes. Has a Someone license that has, with the state to participate in. Well, I mean, commerce. a soldier. Uh, this is a, what I put forward to the court. I think a really good example in one of the, this is in the other case that I, as I'm learning more, I can articulate things a little bit better. So if you think about a soldier, that uh, you're a man or a woman that joins the army you turn into a natural person or an individual within those codes that are applicable to army service men and women. Uh, it's the same thing for a judge or, or whatever the case might be. Obviously, I can, I can say for certain that a statute applying to doctors does not apply to me as I'm not a doctor. A statute applying, so when, the, when that says no person shall do this and then has that same sequence of definitions of person, that I'm not a teacher. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not any of those things. Right. So therefore those statutes don't apply. Uh, they want to get you to believe that they do. And that's another thing when it comes to, yeah, that's just one key, one little cog, one little piece of the machinery that we need to understand better is the definitions. Uh, but it's as, as, as is known by you guys and Alphonse, it, that's not everything definitions alone aren't going to do it but when you add that that's pretty it's a it's a pretty big piece i think when you then further add more things to it it, it just all of it falls into place to show you know these ordinances and codes they're not they're, they're as it's said a, a, a municipality you know it's a collection of inhabitants and inhabitants are members of the corporation this is this is american jurisprudence that we're talking about and this is just stuff that's been lost and obfuscated and not even the judges and lawyers know it a lot of times it seems and it, it's a shock to their system just the same as like well shit the, the, oh, that neuters a lot of things that these municipalities are getting away with right and so the fifth circuit in in, in rejecting the appeal they said it was time barred but they also went in a little further and was kind of making fun of me saying about these inhabitants and, and quoting American jurisprudence, you know, because um, this, this strikes at the heart of the funding mechanism for these municipalities yes. to uh, you know, violate all our rights with all <laughs> these, these, these rules or policies that, that mean nothing under the, under the Constitution as far as the law goes. And so color of law. I mean, yeah, it couldn't be any <laughs> couldn't be any clearer. And that and that's exactly what obviously what the Reconstruction era amendments were for. And this is what they still are getting away with. And, that's and right. unfortunately, we the people have dropped the ball, as has been expressed numerous times. We've been dumbed down, we've been lulled to sleep, and we've accepted our chains of gold. We've we've given away our chains of iron and accepted chains of gold instead. And that, that, we, that's right. So we've we've allowed the capture of all our organizations and and institutions, and no one should expect this to come back immediately. Nope. This is going to be hard work because we've allowed it to go so long that. No one can just jump back in and expect the rules to be followed when they haven't been followed for right. 100 years. There's a giant edifice that has been constructed, and it is, it's, 
we've talked about this in Alphonse group, a lot of us, that this comes down, it's good, it's good night to this entire system that's been built upon fraud, upon, you know, we can get into the, the upon the fraudulent money, upon the, 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 the systems of control that it, it, literal enslavements. I mean, I'm not, I don't say that word lightly. It's what it is. It's people talk about these great freedoms that we have. Okay. Can you drive down the road? without license, registration, proof of insurance. No, you can't. Can you own a home without paying taxes every every quarter or biannually or what the case might be? Can, can you do it? it? The list can go on and on. Yeah, paper and, pleads and you're basically renting your property from the government. Yeah. And can I grow my grass out? No, you cannot. Uh, you Can I paint my house this color? No, you cannot. Can Can I work on my car and my driveway? No, we'll take it away from you if you do that. You can't before do we, these things. Before we get into that case, is there anything else you want to highlight over here or wrap this up? Well, uh, First Amendment Assembly. And, sure. I mean, basically, the most agree tell some people what happened. So, so you did you go out there and they threatened you or you just refused to assemble because you highlighted it? So pull up pull up the reply brief and you'll see so the city the city of oxford is i would like to show the video of that you have in linkedin here that is for the city council yes unreal saying unbelievable things unbelievable things unbelievable that the cheap so this is my biggest piece of evidence is these public records of during this COVID madness, the city of Oxford was, it it sharpened my, it sharpened me as a human being and it sharpened me as a soul here to like have to breathe deeply and be ready to go into Kroger or to go into Walmart without a mask because it was one, Oxford was one of those places as you guys obviously experienced with the court, it, it was just, it, it was horrible. It wasn't a great place. And so what they were doing, they were just going wild. So yeah, they, they have, their own words are going to be the things that, that get them. Uh, the chief of police literally said, there's a, there's a first amendment freedom of assembly. We can't just take, we can't, during this time, it was, the, the, it was just on the heels of the George Floyd protests. So the city of Oxford has, was having massive protests where people were lying down in the street, like blocking traffic literally committing disorderly conduct so that the police the chief the police said we can't allow people to have to you know be committing acts of disorderly conduct while at the same time going arrest and going and taking people out of their yard just for being there he urged them he i mean he bordered, bordered on begged please use existing law use existing laws that we have you, he, he said the judge isn't gonna the, the, he's talked to the judge and the attorney and they're not going to agree with us on this like he and the city manager who are the two executive executive let's call them branch members of the city obviously the chief of police is in charge of you know, and then the city manager is the chief executive officer right. so they have qualified immunity that's what they would be sheltered under they're not going to get it they knowingly you know they knowingly violated clearly established law and their own words tell them tell us that they knew that this was going down. So yeah, this gets us into, cause I don't want to get away from this yet. Cause there's some critical, you know, you've got qualified immunity, which I'm dealing with, with the chief of police and the city manager. And then you've got absolute legislative immunity, which is a tougher nut to crack. It's similar to the judicial immunity uh, or prosecutorial immunity. So these are quotes that I found out and I pulled up and I have in my complaint and in the other subsequent filings thereafter about so the judge cole insinuated that i, I was not uh, there was no enforcement well, of course there was an enforcement I, I this did not get enforced upon me i will say there were 23 citizens they were all college students that this mass gathering ordinance was enforced on but there was enforcement there was our, our vice mayor at the time he's now the mayor he went on don lemon's show bragging about the enforcement this is the video that went viral. There was a viral video that went out about with Miami police officers. It's actually city of Oxford police officers showing up 
at the door of college students having a party. What's up, guys? Who lives here? Comfort disabled, <laughs> Milligan Road, Yankee Road, called out on fire by Battalion 110. going to be in the roundabout causing traffic issues. They're going to need an assist with tow. So you probably know why I want to talk to you. Just too many people. Well, do you know what the, the ordinance is? Ten people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had, how many people live in the house? Eight, eight people live here. Okay, so kind of how it reads is if you have eight people in the house, then it means you can really only have two people over. Two over. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, we can get everyone It's out. kind of yeah. handcuffed here, you know what I mean? Yep. How many people are in the house? Uh, I, like ten of them just came by, but they're leaving. They're going somewhere else. Maybe 20. 20 people inside? Yeah, you might want to start clearing them out, man. I've never seen this before. There's an input on the computer that you tested positive for COVID? Yes. When was this? This was a week ago. Are you supposed to be quarantining? Yeah, that's why I'm at my house. Do you have other people here and you're positive for COVID? You see the problem? Yeah. I mean, they were honestly all walking by. How many other people have COVID? They all do. Everybody has it? Yeah. And everybody over here has it? Well, I think the two people there, too. Respond with EMS, 6150, Fairfield Road, 40 year old female. That's what we're trying to prevent, man. Yeah, I know. We want to keep this town open. The issue is. Uh, that's why I was staying home. One call for I just walked down, too. I know, but there were probably seven people, seven or eight people that left your house yeah. when you told them to leave. So you're not quarantining if you're mixing with other people. One ball 40, okay? One so everybody here has it. Oh my gosh. Here's your ID back. Wow. Probably not the only campus. Not so many tested positive, but partying. We see college kids partying, not socially distancing all the time. And here's a perfect example of it. William Snavely is a vice mayor of Oxford, Ohio. My mayor, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I was a college student once, I get it. <laughs> but really? Yeah, uh, I had the same reaction you did. And I think most of the people in this town did as well. When you see that the students admitting that he tested positive for COVID a week before knew about the ordinance against large gatherings, Yet and still, they're having a party, and there are other people there who are positive. I don't, I am told, because, you know, they covered the video, there's no masks, no social distancing. What was your reaction? No. Um, I, I think most people in our town were appalled by it. Uh, there is a mask ordinance in our town that we passed. There's also a mask gathering uh, ordinance that we passed on August 18th, and so... You know, there's, we've done what we can do and the police are trying their best. Uh, it's not always working. It's tough when you're that age because you think you're grown, but especially if you're a male, your brain's not actually fully developed yet. I'm just, it's, it, I, I'm not lying. It's a truth. According, it's, according to the police report obtained by CNN, Oxford police cited six of the men who were at that house party and here's what police told CNN. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that was a soundbite. It's a quote. Police said, we would encourage Miami University students and Oxford residents alike to practice all the proper preventative measures in avoiding the spread of COVID-19. We want to curb the numbers of COVID in our city and parties like this are not helping and are not acceptable. So the fines, I understand, start at $500. Is that enough to discourage this kind of behavior? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, the first offense is $500. The second offense is $1,000. I think the real enforcement comes that these are reported to the university. The university then says that they will uh, have disciplinary procedures against any of those students. So far, there are, let's see, 141 pending cases, but we have not had anyone actually suspended that I'm aware of. What about expulsion? I mean, you're putting people's lives in danger. Well, in egregious cases, they can do that as well. 
But that's not up to the city, obviously. That's up to the university. Okay, but has anyone been charged, any of those students charged $500? Yes. Yes, we've had 73 citations and six mass gathering citations. Are so they going to pay them? Are they going to get are littering and noise? Are they going to pay those citations, the $500? Or are they going to go to court and then the judge is going to say, you don't have to pay it? Because and then. That well done. Solve that anything. remains to be seen. <laughs> that remains to be seen. Expulsion. They should be expelled. That's our. That's our. That's our current mayor. Uh, that's that's that was our vice mayor at the time. Just joyously, wanting expen expulsions. Obviously, I'm not a student, but there there were five hundred dollar fines is what these all these. So there were twenty three citations in total during this time. I, I saw. I knew this video went viral. I saw it. Uh, if that's not a threat, that's, you know, that's not sure that no one knocked on my door and said, you can't do this. But all of my pub, all of the, all of the policymakers of Oxford were, were said this, you know, that, that, that all of the, the, the police were enforcing it. This was, so this is where it gets an interesting conversation about specifics about a sub, what's called a subjective chill and chilling effect, but I, I no point in getting into that. But Judge Cole essentially said that, that the policy wasn't enforced against me. No kidding. If it were enforced against me, it would no longer be a chilling. That, that's, that's the point of a chilling effect. And he also said that it wasn't threatened to be enforced against me. And I, I, I disagree with that, sir. This is a, uh, this is a threat. I'm, I'm reading line 34 from your final amendment. And it, and it says, Jones states, which I assume is a city council model. That's the police chief. Oh, the police chief. So Jones states, I have talked to the judge and attorneys, further stating that there are things that I don't want to say at a public meeting because I don't want to find, don't want people to find out a way around to get to get around the ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> what What's that way? What's that way to get around the ordinance, sir? Maybe it's I'm peaceably assembling. I mean, I don't want to say things in a public. He actually said that. That's unbelievable. And then previously, Elliot, is he a council member? He is the city manager. Okay, so the city manager, Elliot, states that if the city put together an ordinance, he was not sure he wanted to ask the police to be involved, noting that if citations were administrative, he felt the city would fare better. Elliot noted that if the city goes to court with a criminal charge for a gathering of 10, over 10 people, he was not sure the county prosecutor or the judge would support the city. Yeah, these are these are. I mean, these are their own words. So there are two. They deliberated this, and this wasn't just. They didn't just do it. They deliberated. They talked about this for weeks. So I'll just read you a couple of these. If if these aren't threats, and if these aren't threats of punishment by the city council members, so and I'm not gonna. I don't have the who to whom they were. To who who said this? But I know it. It's in the other filings. I took this directly from one of the other filings in my case. There should be significant fees for large gatherings. When are you going to lay the hammer down and write tickets? This applies to a lot of laws. I wouldn't need it enforced, knowing that there was some effect just from the threat of it being enforced. That's literally the chilling effect. We need to educate the public and not have to enforce these penalties. But if we have to, we will. This is a prevention strategy. The threat of it needs to be there. We need to use this as a threat to get cooperation. We should plaster the town with this threat, even if we don't enforce it. This code should be made a painful experience for anyone, and this is going to apply across Oxford. So these are all quotes from either the chief of police, the city manager, or the council members. If uh, they're literally threatening, they're literally talking about punishments and threats. This has a chill. This had a chilling effect on my First Amendment freedom to peaceably assemble, sure. and it also violated a beautiful thing. If we want to get into like the Fourteenth Amendment clauses, so I'm arguing the privileges or immunities clause, uh, which is a, as the defense counsel would put it, a defunct. Uh, it's 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 archaic, and no one uses it anymore. Sure, because now, like we've got due, pro we've got abortion out of due process. We've got gay marriage out of due process. The due process, substantive due process, is like their vessel to do with what they will. 
because of the slaughterhouse cases that were actually in Louisiana that, that greatly restricted the privileges or immunities clause. But one of the, in, during, in the slaughterhouse cases, one of the privileges or immunities of what they deemed of the United States citizen was the right to peace of the right to assembly. So right there, I mean, this case is, as far as I'm concerned, I've made this argument that my case is tailor made for the privileges or immunities clause. So all three clauses, equal protection, I have all the same rights as every, every citizen in Ohio. We all have the same rights. We all have the same rights, privileges, and immunities. This is why you cannot have a municipality making law, making police powers. This is why they cannot do what they did, or, or else you'd have a thousand municipalities across Ohio all making different laws. That's not the way the police powers work, just not. And I think that's my, that's been my biggest epiphany here. Uh, if you wanted to go to article, go to article 18, section three of the Ohio constitution, and we'll get into just how ultra vires the actions of the city are. Article 18, section. Article 18, section three. It should be about municipalities. Article 18, Section 3, Municipal Powers of the Local Self-Government, subject to the requirements of Section 1 of Article 5 of the Constitution, municipality shall have authority to exercise all powers of local self-government and to adopt and enforce within their limits such local police, sanitary, and other similar regulations as are not in conflict with the general laws. Yes. So this was in 1912 that the people of Ohio adopted home, the Home Rule Amendment, Article 18 of the Ohio Constitution, giving greater powers to local cities. Essentially, you know, you didn't want to have the same laws as little podunk farm rural cities should not have should, that's not the same as the city of toledo or cincinnati or columbus or any of these burgeoning cities so there are two specific things that we can see so we're this is not obviously this is a let's call it a grand statue this is this is so let's do some construction here so just eliminate municipalities shall have authority to exercise all powers of local self-government at the beginning, I didn't really know what all this meant. That the police powers light bulb just went off six months ago for me. So a year and a half ago, I didn't know the significance of, of this in regard to the mass gathering ordinance. So the defense counsel argued, well, we have we have all powers of local self-government. So we get to do whatever the hell we want is how they are interpreting that. So once I delved into the Ohio Supreme Court case law and how this has been interpreted, so all powers of local self-government, it's specifically the inner workings of the municipal government itself, period. It's, it's salaries and benefits. It's the control of municipal streets to some degree. Obviously, you got but the control of municipal streets, uh, control of public property, of hiring and firing. It's the inner workings of the government itself. And once you venture outside of that, which my property, my rights are that we, the people are outside of that. They don't get that. They think because we're there, you're in our territory, you're in our imaginary line. So therefore we get, you're, you're part of, no, 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 no. So we have all powers of local self-government. Then we have a separator. We have, and, and, so these are two separate things. You have all powers of local self-government and to adopt and enforce. Remember these are municipalities shall have authority to adopt and enforce within their limits. So local police, sanitary, and other similar regulations that are not in conflict with general law. Adopt, that means to take from, to take from the General Assembly's general laws. We have cities now enacting, they're, they're, they're creating their own police powers. The, 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 the police power is a state power. It is a sovereign power. And this is what is, once all of us start to understand the police powers, we'll be able to start finding similar codes and ordinances that are municipal like the grass which we'll get into that that's pervasive across the united states uh and i know the the general law here in ohio says nothing about long grass the general law in michigan which i've delved into because of that's in the sixth circuit says nothing about long grass it's all about noxious weeds but i digress 
So they have to adopt their police powers. They can't just create their police power. And this is what is actually difficult with and, your and this situation. this is because a municipality is a subsection and derives all of their power from what the legislator um, yes passes. for the most part so there's in within the home within home rule uh, I was called jurisprudence within within the home rule category you have what's called home rule powers and then you have Dillon rule Dillon is a judge from Iowa that basically so Dillon rule would mean <clears throat> the municipality can only do what the legislature can do period end of story I think Pennsylvania is really close to a Dillon rule state uh, there are a lot so there's a mix between Dillon rule and home rule Ohio has one of the, the most uh, wide ranging home rule. It's one of the most wide ranging home rule states, meaning municipalities have a lot of power. They get to, they can do things that they can go, they can, as long as it's about their own local self government, they can do enact ordinances and codes. Remember, local self government only. This is only the inner workings of their own municipality, but they have great leeway to do what the General Assembly does not do. So that they, they have leeway to make their own, their own law to some degree within that subset of local self-government. But once they venture outside of that and adopt, when we're talking about police powers, when we're talking about sanitary, when we're talking about things outside of local self-government, they have to adopt those laws. And it can't, it can't conflict with protected rights from the Bingo. Constitution, right? Should, should, exactly. And, and this is why it's so rare. This is why this mass gathering ordinance is, is frankly rare, because it's not often that you find just a literal on its face unconstitutional ordinance or code. They're usually misapp misapplied. They're usually relatively constitutional, but they're just egregiously misapplied. This one, I don't care who you are. I don't care if I'm a trust, a partnership, an association, whatever, that, telling me how many one. people... To telling me how many rest restricting my gathering, that's against the general law of the general law. So, so this is where these entities, and this is what I was going to say about your particular case and those, one of your cases, the one with your bike, the, the traffic stuff. This is why it's so difficult. This is such a difficult avenue where people think it's easy. Yeah, I'm just not going to renew my license. I'm not going to have registration, and I'm just going to travel because that's what I saw on a YouTube video. So. Every state, I believe, adopts the like the, the tra uniform traffic code or whatever from the United States. So these are all now in, incorporated within the police powers of the state. I'm not saying it's it's still regulated. I, I'm not saying that it's, it's right, but it's just a more difficult avenue because literally what, the things I'm dealing with, they're so like they're they're municipalities creating their own police power, which is right. like so far outside of the scope of their lawful authority it's not even funny so to me it's like you know shooting fish in a barrel to a degree it's, it's just it's much it's it's much it's low hanging it's the lowest of the hanging fruit is when your municipality is doing things creating police powers that the state doesn't have if you can't find that if you can't find that police power in the state codes or statutes they shouldn't they can't be doing it they don't yeah. have, they're not a sovereign entity that creates their own police power. So the, the issue here is if you get a ticket, speed ticket going down the road and you want to fight this and you want to bring it to the, basically the level we're talking about that this ordinance or statute doesn't apply to me because it's a commercial right. entity, whatever. So this, the municipality is going to give you the ticket. You're going to go to the municipality court and they're going to railroad you. And you're going to mm -hmm. have to get the judge and the prosecutor and all these people wrapped up and doing illegal things in order to bring it to federal court. And you have to win there because otherwise yeah. the heck doctrine is going to keep you from doing it. And so if you win, and even if they railroad, if they railroad you to the point your due process is is violated then you could still probably go to federal court but only then then you have to go to federal court and get him to rule against the municipality so yep. this is a big deal and that's why it's so much work to do a speedy ticket 
yep. insurance. So much work. It, it, is, it is right to be able to do that, but it's so involved. It's so involved. And then once again, the, like the Heck Doctrine or the Rooker Feldman or whatever, like the, these things preclude you from like what happened with Brett. I mean, if Brett is having a difficult time, I, I'm not going to try to do that. Sorry. Right. And, and it's it's just and, and I and God bless those that are. Uh, it's just I'm OK right now as I currently sit to have a license. Have my like I, I'm OK with that. And I don't want to get into the whole like there's other things that I just I don't I can't wrap my head around believing in uh, the, the anarchy that I feel would be created with with a situation like this. But that's neither here nor there. But it's a difficult thing. So what yes. I feel like this stuff that I'm doing and I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch. It sucks. It, it's a and I can understand why more people aren't doing it because none of us yet have had success. I think it's going to come. I do. I really Absolutely. do. And at that point, maybe some, you know, the floodgate will open, but maybe there'll be some more holes in the dam that start spewing out. It's it's a disappointment to me right now as, as we currently sit. No one else in Pennsylvania has filed a property tax lawsuit after Alphonse. No one. I mean, we got one, we got Steve Emerson one, essentially. I can't remember her name, or I think it's a her. Uh, and, and she filed, and Beth. Uh, is about Beth to file something too. Uh, did she, she file one in Pennsylvania? Not, okay. not yet, not yet. Uh, but she's she's working on that now, and she Good. I she mean, wants because to the get templates, way the templates more there. The, the, yeah, the temp the templates there. Benny in Florida, and then Dawn Pettit in Florida also. Uh, they, they, so there are, but uh, I, I we need more. Like we just need more people. Sure. And and I don't think the the proper venue, in my opinion, the proper venue is not battling these things in state court. In the municipal courts for a year or, or or what have you good luck because you're gonna you're probably gonna get railroaded and then once you do you're precluded so the fight needs to be in federal court and we need to find the low-hanging fruit and in my opinion hey i grew my grass i just like the way my prairie grass looked i grew my grass out <laughs> we want to go down that road right now it, it's the yeah. it's about the most yeah so it's, let's it's, get into think, that you you had filed a second suit and what happened basically is the city wanted you to cut your grass and you didn't want it to, you, you had it organized the way you wanted it. And they came in and cut your grass and cut down all the things you and your wife planted and damaged your property. And they, they thought it was perfectly okay. Yep. Now, I think you said since then, they've developed a policy not to do that. Probably no. because of you. It, it was because of me, but because I mean, Oxford once again is left leaning, and they like they they claim to be environmentalists. As far as I'm concerned, what I'm doing, I'm not I'm not using as much gasoline when I'm mowing my grass. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. spraying pesticides to keep a nicely manured. To me, when you're talking about, they actually called my grass noxious. There's no such thing. Like there's a noxious weeds category in the Ohio Revised Code, you know, there's some, there's called noxious weeds. They called my grass no, noxious grass. I think Roundup grass sprayed to shit and, and all of that. That's noxious to me, but that's just, so yeah, uh, they now have a, they have a net. They, the gas. Well, I use less gas. Yeah. I mean, you, this should be, you guys should be loving this. So yeah, they, uh, they actually, there was a fervor within Oxford during all of this. I would get questions. What are you doing with the grass? My parents, my mom's lived in Oxford her whole life. They'd get questions. What are you guys doing with, like, what's the story with, with the grass here? What are you doing with the grass? So it created enough of a fervor that the city passed a naturalized lawn ordinance. Now you have to get permitted from the city. You have to, you know, yeah, you have to go ask them to get it. And, and what I was doing wouldn't have counted because it was just, you can't it's not just grass but if you have like flowers and like what other kind of like natural better grass than i had you can get a permit to do a naturalized lawn so i i did that which i think is pretty cool so yeah uh they 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 determined so what i did is i mowed along the strip along the i live in a very i live in oxford and i live in a, i have a lot of i have some land here it was my grandpa my grandpa built this house in 1950, whatever, before Oxford got bigger. 
So it's right on Broadway, like it's in the middle of town. Uh, but I have a, a pretty decent yarn. So I decided I, I like the look of the grass and I decided I wanted to grow my grass out in some spots. So I mowed along the roadway. I, I mowed along the, 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 you know, the, whatever, the common area or whatever it's called, the, the curb strip, mowed that. And I mowed about six feet worth along the road, at least six feet, maybe even more. But the rest, I edged around all my trees. I nicely manicured. And then from, so I edged around all the trees and then from tree to tree, I had strips. It looked like a golf course kind of, it was just two strips going from tree to tree. So it was, it was, you know, it was just long grass and then strips of short grass. So I ended up getting a notice uh, sometime in like, I think June. Then that kind of perked my, okay, here we go. Here, Cause my brother had been, my brother had done this years before and he got notices from the city and they ended up, my, they ended up succumbing to the pressure and mowed. And it's a sad story. My dad literally like mowed the grass and mowed over like baby bunnies that were hiding in the long grass. So that had happened years prior. So I did, I did anyway, did it again. So at this time I'm waiting to, they said they were going to, they called in an inspection. They did an inspection. They left a notice of a notice on my door, a big bright yellow notice that said inspection. We will re-inspect on this day. Well, another thing here, go to any thesaurus or dictionary and search and inspect are synonyms. To inspect is to search. So no warrant, no permission from the owner. So they come back and put another notice on my door and they go across. So my house is, let's say, here, my parents live across the woods here. There's a woods, big woods that separates us. My mom owns the property, uh, both of them. So they, the code enforcement people went over and put a notice on her uh, fence as well. So they just, in her, their house, you have to go up this hill. It's not, it's not, you can't view it from the public. It's, it's more secluded than mine. So they, they went to both properties. At that point, things started to get interesting. I, I went and I filed in the, you know, in the, in homage to Randy Kelton, I filed a criminal complaint. I went up to the city of Oxford police department and I said, they're menacing by stalking and, and trespassing. The police actually, to their credit, went over, talked to the code enforcement lady. And she said, we're allowed, we, we this is my job. I'm allowed, this is what I do. I'm allowed to do it. And so I, the, the police officer tells me that, and I ask, I ask, well, how are they allowed to get around that pesky Fourth Amendment? You guys have to, in order to come on my property, you have to have a, a warrant or a court order, or there has to be some extend, like some circumstances that that emergency calls you. He had no answer. This police officer, I don't know. Uh, and maybe they should make all police officers code enforcement officers to to get around that that little requirement. But they ended up, they ended up uh fulfilling the way there were ma mailing communications you can read all of it in the in the complaint about the facts set uh there were i've got it pulled up on the facts section i'm following yeah along. there were certified mailings that were back and forth i I, e I was emailing them saying like at this point i was super new to this and i, I sent an affidavit of you know the affidavit of facts and affidavit of status for my mom that said we codes and ordinances that. don't apply to us and so we did all that so it's, it is amazing thinking about how far we've come in just a couple of years. I look back on that affidavit of status and, and kind of cringe a little bit. But hey, it was. That's why it was we waited until now to, to be on video, <laughs> right? Right. No, we, exactly. we know what we're talking about. Yeah. So basically, I, I was doing all of these things. I, I got the city manager involved. I included him in the emails. I got the code enforcement director he's called the the community development manager i got him involved so i these are what's this is critical this is what we need to also discuss these are policy makers uh you can get you can get uh, a municipality can get sued by in, under 1983 action in four ways you've got unconstitutional policy which is rare that's that's like that mass gathering ordinance that was an unconstitutional policy Mm -hmm. You've got custom or practice. This is they customarily do this. They, 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 they by custom or practice, they, they oftentimes misapply the ordinances and codes. That's a custom or practice. Uh, you've got, you've got failure to train. 
which is very difficult. It's very difficult to prove. And then you have policymaker liability. So if there's a policymaker that is that they've they're deemed a policymaker of the of the municipality, if they acquiesce, if they knowingly acquiesce to unconstitutional activities of their subordinates, that will bring the municipality in in a 1983 action. So, so like if the chief of police is there, he's the policymaker mm-hmm. for the police. If he yes. says do this and it's outside of his office, then that's you got it. Yes, that, 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 the, the chief of police would be a policymaker. All the city council members would be policymakers. Your mayor is obviously a policymaker. Your community development, your code enforcement director, that's a policymaker. Your city manager, policymakers. So what we want to do is get as many policymakers involved through our communications as we can. This is a critical thing that we have to do. Uh, it's not just, you, you just don't want to be communicating with the code enforcement. You want to get there, you want to get the mayor. Why not? You, going overboard a little bit, maybe with all the city council members that might be, you know, but get the mayor, get the, the city manager, the chief of police. Why not get as many policymakers involved in your communications as possible. So when they knowingly acquiesce, you're, and you might not want to tell them this, but it's this is like, you know, this is what this is qualified immunity stuff. This is knowingly violating clearly established law. It's clearly established that policymakers, if they knowingly acquiesce to constitutional rights of their subordinates, that brings them in and their uh, municipality in, and that brings that that loses their qualified immunity. Which you know, that's what we're that's what we're, we're looking to get past the immunities here. Well, that's the that should be that should be one of our main focuses as well as how do we get past qualified immunity? How do we get past legislative immunity? I think that's so, called giving them a lot of rope <laughs> and notification. And will, yes, absolutely. Yes, and, and just and, and hey, if they if they desist in their in their pursuit, then great. Then you got them off your back for that. You win. Like, but if they don't, which they won't, most likely, then they will continue to. And it does get interesting. I find a difficult time. I this all just happened like they so to play out what happened with me. <clears throat> Notification sent. They played out their process. They hired a third party lawn care company, which who I decided not to sue. Uh, I could have I could have brought them in under the nexus, you know, the private actor nexus. Requirement. I didn't want to do it. He's a good guy. I, I, I know him a little bit now. And I just didn't want to do that. So they had a third party lawn care company come bushwhack my grass, which included several sycamore tree saplings that my, like, as you said, my wife and I planted these. We rescued them from this particular place. I'll never forget the day we rescued like 30 of these sycamore saplings. I gave many of them to donated them to this arborist guy that we know. Some of them are growing like the, the ones that we kept. They're doing well. They, they, they mean a lot to me and they, bushwhack those just the same so i come home from work and i am i was just like oh my stomach sank when i saw what had happened so and the, and the bill was 570 dollars 570 dollars so it was a uh, 150 dollars for a fine of a placard that they supposedly left in our yard and that we supposedly allegedly removed from the yard this is a, so this is where my eighth amendment claim comes in is that was a fine. The other things were not technically fines. They were, uh, remedial fees and billings for the, for the lawn care company and for the mailings, but this the is, $150. This is just after Borso basically said, I'm coming back to the stormwater pro- mm, property. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, she, she just. Uh, and I even, so there's an Ohio revised code provision. If you want to look this up, it's ORC, <clears throat> ORC 731.51. Notice to owner to cut noxious weeds or remove litter service. Upon so this written- is what, this is what, <clears throat> this is what they use. And so if you skip ahead to 731.54, this is what they use to threaten to put a lien on our property. Okay, you want me to read it? Uh, written return to county auditor. Oh. Times in there, this is how we're 
this is how we get our power to do what we're doing with your with your grass. Seven three one point five four. This is a this is the Ohio okay. Revised Code. So okay. it, let me read it. To, let me read it. Yes. The legislative authority. Let me highlight it. The legislative authority of a municipal municipal corporation shall make a written return to the county auditor of its action under section seventy three point five one to seventy three point five three inclusive of the revised code which a statement of the charges for its services, the amount paid for the performing of such labor, the fees of the officers who made the service of the notice and return, and a proper description of the premises, such amounts, when allowed, shall be entered the tax duplicate, shall be a lien upon the such lands from the date of the entry, and shall be collected as other taxes and returned to the municipal corporation with the general fund. So, if you notice, in order to do 731.54, which they they state multiple times in 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 the in the notices that I got, according to seven. So, in order to do 731.54, you have to do 731.51. Let's go back to 731.51, and that's specifically noxious weeds. It has nothing to do about long grass. It is only noxious weeds. So. There's a lot of there's a lot of so this is the this is the procedural process that they're required. This is the this is my procedural due process right here. Boom, you're you're done. Like you didn't do this stuff, but we, they don't they don't think that they do. You have to this is a police power. And once again, if you remember Article 18, Section 3 of the Ohio Constitution, they have to adopt these things. So they adopt pieces of it, they adopt portions of it, but then they greatly expand upon other areas where the, now it's it's noxious grass it's it's wherever the hell we want it to be so this is i i i emailed borzo and i said hey come on out to the property and show me these noxious weeds and show me the weeds that i need to get rid of according to the ohio revised code here she said no it, it's it's not just weeds it's grass it's 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 all kinds of other things so you know it was and i ignored. see you a, a mail fraud complaint <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so mail fraud. Uh, I, I filed a criminal complaint with the AG, the Attorney General, uh, the prosecutor. I I misinterpreted. I filed it to like the federal court prosecutor and one other. Oh, the sheriff. Uh, nothing came of it at all. Which, of course. Yeah. yeah, which that's what happens. And I guess that's just the the point is just to get your record out. And, so, and so you met with Perry, right? Yep, yeah, met with the code enforcement head, the community development manager, the community development director. After this all was done with Perry, and we had a good conversation, and he was open to a lot. He, he was he was a he seems like a good, reasonable man, and he was open to a lot of the things I was saying. He said, "This is going to change. This is going to completely what you're saying here. This is going to completely." change the way municipalities operate. I said, yeah, it's just going to change the way that they've been misoperating for 80 years. No, we're going to well, correct the way they are operating. Yes. Right. And, and the, the, yeah, so that, and this is just a hard thing for them to grasp. It was like, yeah, you don't have any control over my property, man. And I explained the whole person thing. I explained the inhabitants and that you guys only have control over the Taco Bells, the Pizza Huts, the the, the the goodwills you know the the commercial entities or the 501c3 entities the, the 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 those that have nexus or citus that's who you can control to some yeah. degree through now your tell police us about a nexus or a citus sure so a taxable citus is what all of the people doing their property tax cases are dealing with it's essentially a place of a business or crime as i believe steve emerson has described it uh, it's what it's where the business is situated so a nexus requirement is just a connection, a nexus with the state, uh, usually through filing, you know, uh, articles of incorporation with the secretary of state uh, or whatever other entity, because it's not just commerce, you know, that we do have charitable organizations. We have uh, other types of entities that are created that are out. It's not so we don't want to. It's not just commerce, but it's just a nexus. It cre it's a created entity, uh, a, a trust. You know, that's why we don't want to put our properties and trusts because lo and behold hey trust is one of those persons that i that we read about in that in the ohio revised or i'm sorry in the city's codes so we that that's like we people think that they're sheltering their property when in fact they're doing the exact opposite of that they're they're opening their property up to 
Well, know. you might shelter it from some taxes for a death, but you're going to open yourself up to regulation from the municipality. Exactly. So it, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, so it, it's so. So what do you do? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you live free. You just you, you know, you, like what you do is you know that you are one of the sovereign people. You're one of the sovereign men and women of this country, and what that carries with it is a lot of power that we don't know. And we are, we are, there are, we're the ultimate sovereign, as you can see in the case law of Chisholm v. Georgia or Scott v. Sanford. We are the ultimate sovereign, and we have granted through the enact, through the adoption of our Constitution, co equal sovereigns of the United States of America and each state. They're also sovereign. We're the ultimate. All political power is inherent in the people, as our our state constitutions say. So that's all. That's what we have to do. Is there's no there's no uh, magic document. There's no magic filing or nexus. Or, like we just need to know and live in live in that power. Live in the knowledge of who we are. We're we're un, we have unalienable rights granted by God, granted by our Creator, and that's what I grew up believing that's what i grew up being taught and that's what, what we're I'm told gonna, yes that's what we're told and that's what i'm that's what i'm going to that's that's how i'm going to live my life and so now that I let know, me ask you and, and then we'll probably get into this with benny in the next in the next uh video but you know if you have to continue pay rent to the municipality via property taxes but you don't want to put your property in a trust you have to find a way to get get your property off the tax rolls in order to stave off the municipality having authority over the property. So like mm. you said, it's a double-edged sword, but this property tax fight is going to have to be waged. Um, probably not just by Alphonse uh, to make this happen. Yes. And the thing is though, is that even creating that just creating a nexus creating a trust at your house doesn't technically create that doesn't necessarily create that taxable citizen for property taxes you know because you could be a trust there could be a trust uh domiciled there but if they're not exercising any activity you know if they're not doing commerce there i, I guess that is a tr slippery slope because if you are a trust let's say it's a tell it's like the house and stock market are you Doing business there, I guess, I could see that. But but it's that, listed in that list, trust. Of course, yeah, for the so. ordinances and codes. Yeah, right. well, true, and it's a taxpayer also. Right. So I just, I would feel, regardless of my semantics here, I, I guess you're right. Yeah, it, it would. I think it would be best to. We don't want to. We don't want our properties and trusts unless we are sheltering them. Unless we have a bunch of rental properties, you know. I, obviously, an LLC. There are certain. That's the whole point of creating these entities is to take advantage of certain uh, shelters, certain protections, certain tax loopholes, whatever the case might be. So there is an argument, there, there, there's an argument to be made for them to some degree, but we just need to know that once we open, once we do that, we open that property up to the decrees of the municipality. And at the time here in the, the grass complaint, there was no, there was no nexus. There was no Citus, there was nothing. We were just a sovereign man living, well, sovereign man, like I was just sovereign, a human being living on that land. And they didn't care. They didn't see any distinction between myself and other creatures of statute. And they carried out their activities. And so, where we are with this one, uh, it's fully briefed. I actually just filed today. I requested a sir reply from Judge McFarland who I showed you that court case of his today, I have, hey, I, I, I like to see God winks. Uh, and he was a Trump appointee, October 10th, 2018. My birthday is October 10th. So he had a really good ruling in that case that I sent you that I think would help help your Brandy's appeal possibly about yeah. religious freedoms. Uh, it, it was also upheld in the Sixth Circuit. So this there's, there's precedent there that you could take advantage of. And I I got a feeling that this is a good one. I got a feeling that he's a no-nonsense guy based well, on... They're out there. They're out there. Yes. It's just not as prevalent as they used to be. You know, somebody, somebody was commenting on this YouTube. We did the live stream. Somebody said, oh, um, seems like there's no no winners. I was expecting better news. It seems like Steve's the only winner here. 
and I, you know, I didn't reply to him, but I should have said, well, we're not dealing with the same judges in 1984 right. as Steve was. <laughs> we're in 2024. Yeah. A lot has COVID. changed. There's a lot of water under that bridge. That's and there's right. a lot of there's a lot of power that and, and that's another thing that <clears throat> it's not only maybe in there it maybe like Judge Cole, you know, the other like in his heart of hearts, he it, it it's gonna take some it's gonna take some courage from these judges sure. to do this. Let us let's not let's not you know, not, we have to understand that as well. We're, we're, but I am convinced and I'm 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 confident that once you start pulling that string or once one domino, one domino, it's going to, it's going to have a cascading effect. And, and I think that's why we haven't seen any of these rulings yet. If, if there are any success of ones, it's because they probably sealed it or um, they, they're just scared of what the unintended consequences are going to be, mm. you know? Oh, and they're, they're, I mean, they're significant, but what, what, so, so this is where the the two cases, and particularly, okay, and I just want to go back to this grass. I'm yeah, sorry, I'll, go back to the, I was going to go through your to, causes of action. Sure. If you so, have something else first, go well, ahead. just in the terms of the mass gathering case, going back to the appeal in the Sixth Circuit, it's interesting. It was the the the, the case. I, it was ruled that I didn't have standing, so I I assume that my opponent, I, he also you know he surprised me with his request for oral argument, but he's also going into all kinds of he's basically opening up the entirety of the case again in terms of i have 1985-3 i have you know the, the griffin v breckenridge the, the discriminatory animus so he's opening up all these things i figured he'd just stick to the standing part so i get to argue everything i get to argue these police power creations i get to argue the, the statutory construction i get to argue 1985-3 in front of the sixth circuit and present i think it's ridiculous that there's a just the discriminatory animus requirement was only supposed to be for private conspirators that's the whole you read griffin that, that, that so it seems weird to me that this defense counsel would have not just stuck to the standing part but that's not so but i have like the sixth circuit now they're, 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 they're stupid got, they're stupid they're, yeah they are must be so so these are what, like, what is the in, t- what are the uh consequences if you win oh boy it's over and that's like so the Sixth Circuit, you talk about presidential value now. Like now I get to argue, now I get to go to the Sixth Circuit. I figured I might have to do this after Judge Cole, you know, with the with I'm sorry, after Judge McFarlane with the grass case, if he maybe didn't make the right. So now I get to present these these ultra virus police powers to the Sixth Circuit. Like it this is this has been a it was a really big, like, whoa. So now I'm super excited and confident that I know my argument so much better than this guy. I'm going to kick this guy's ass in oral argument. And he's, he, the stuff he presents, it's just, it's paltry and no offense to him, but I like, it just is. So, but now I get to like, n- now we get to talk about some serious possible precedent from the sixth circuit. It's not just like a Trinzi Pagliaro type situation. That could really change the way life and with yes. interactions with municipalities, et cetera, oh, go. Big time, big time. So, yeah, so getting back just in the, the terms of the grass, the causes of action, obviously, I have 1983. I have Fourth Trust Amendment. Pass. I have, well, that's state law, state claims, you know, trespass, negligence, uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I think civil that might conspiracy. be civil conspiracy. There you go. So, and then I have Fourth Amendment uh fifth amendment i had sixth and seventh in there those are out like the, i the, i don't even think they've been they haven't been uh incorporated to the states yet and the sixth amendment wouldn't have applied it wasn't a criminal matter the seventh amendment didn't apply but i have eighth i have ninth which is i i think it's a novel somewhat novel ninth it amendment is. argument that i'm making uh and especially what i find most most powerful about it and, and is, tell tell the tell the audience about the ninth amendment and why no one sure. uses it Sure. It, it's just, it's the rights unenumerated in the constitution do not, it, essentially what rights that aren't listed in the first eight amendments, un, those unenumerated rights re, are retained by the people that your right to property, 
you know that, that that's what i'm arguing here so that is that it's not in the first amendment it's not in the second it's not in the third there's no right to property it's not it's front and center in the ohio constitution article one section one says you know the life liberty and uh no no it's the right to life, acquire possess and protect property that's in that's in the ohio constitution so i'm making the argument that that is one of my unenumerated rights that is retained in the Ninth Amendment. So it and, basically and, states that um, anything not covered by the constitutions and the, on the federal or the state level is reserved to the people, and that's the Ninth Amendment. Yes. Right? So a lot of the times, so the, the way that mine is way stronger than any other Ninth Amendment argument that I have found is that, like Griswold v. Connecticut, I think was one where it's the right to privacy you know the right for, it was like uh, the use of contraceptives that was the right to abortion has been that's the ninth amendment has been an avenue for that uh seraph i've talked to you know he's he's considering this uh there was another case that the right to raise your child as you see fit was one of those rights retained by the people so the problem with that is there's no there's no case law. real Right. And, or, or nor is there really a, any meat to it. There's no like the thing that I'm arguing, though, it is the, my right to property, which was violated by these people. That is in my Ohio Constitution. That's Article one, Section one, the right to acquire, possess and protect property. So this is what strengthens if we can find certain of those unenumerated rights, such as the right to property in our state constitution. I think we should be making Ninth Amendment arguments all day long. So, yeah, so I'm making not a, not a, what really is a novel Ninth Amendment argument, although I think we should, once again, I think we should all be putting these in our, in our complaints, putting it, put it out there. Uh, why not? And then I've got all three clauses of the 14th Amendment. Once again, if I've got the due process, which the, the procedural due process stuff is a slam dunk. And then we'll get to their, we'll get to the property maintenance code here in a second too, because my God, what I, what I didn't read a year ago and what I just read a month ago, they have like case closed. Sorry guys, you lose. Uh, but then I've got the equal protection, you know, cause I can grow my, like I have all the same rights once again, because I choose to grow my grass out a little longer. The guy down the street that mows his short, he has all of his property rights. You're not going to trespass onto his property, but because I choose to do things a little differently, you're going to with me. Mm -mm. Uh, and then obviously the privileges or immunities clauses in there again. So, and, and you'd have to read the slaughterhouse cases, yes. rights that yes. owe the, rights that owe owe their existence to the federal constitution. Which I have, I have a Fourth Amendment. I have a I have a takings clause, Fifth Amendment in there. Uh, those are, you know, federal constitutional rights. Which the Therefore, Sixth Circuit has done some things on the takings clause recently, right? Yeah, they had the Tawanda Hall, I believe, is the young lady's name that, that had the takings of the property taxes where she owes $10,000 and they take it for the whole home for 300000 Well, you have to pay the difference. So it's a step in the right direction. The right. Sixth Circuit's it fantastic. Was, it, was, it, was a, it was a small step, but <clears throat> what it basically did was she owed, a say, a $10,000 tax bill. Well, she had a $300,000 house. Well, previously, the city just comes, takes a whole house, and doesn't doesn't give you anything and but now from the ruling in the sixth circuit says well if you sell that house if the city takes the house i think they have to put a lien on it now but if they somehow do take the house they can only take their ten thousand, and they have to refund the 290 back to the homeowner right so they get to take the house but they have to give the cash this is what steve and alphonse have talked about like they this is why they, 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 you can't portion out from a business. You can't take like a little 10 by 10 foot square. You put a lien on the property and you, yeah. So what, what they're doing with us is they're taking the whole kit caboodle. Which is where so, the homestead exem exemption comes in, right? So sure. If you have the, people, yeah. People that homestead exemption was originally meant for people that had businesses on or in their home, you know, like farmers, all that, these, these things. And so the homestead exemption existed to exempt you from businesses taxes uh, in, or reduce them 
and because you have your living operating quarters a farm around, yeah right yeah. you have your living yeah. quarters there so you you weren't taxed on your living you were taxed on your business but it, that has become known that every house is taxed and you can have the homestead exemption mm -hmm. oh yeah right. thanks thanks for the uh gift yeah <laughs> thanks for those crumbs and it's why usually you for, steal and, for everything else in ohio it's like they're i think it's, an, it's an age requirement six you have to be 60 or over or something to qualify for it it's ridiculous but it's not at all like what it originally was intended to be yeah. so just one so pull up uh and i'm gonna show you this is where like it's one of these things how did i miss this when i filed this in may and how did i miss this years ago you know when i started looking into the this code google city of oxford property maintenance code and the first thing that should come up it should say city of oxford city of oxford ohio and it'll say property maintenance so that should take you to the city of oxford's page you yeah. can scroll down there a little bit and you can see the blue link to the property maintenance code uh -huh. So go down to section 104, duties and powers of the code official. And I just found this about a month ago. And it's like, I can't, but it was perfect timing. It was, it was almost as if I were, if I was saving this as like the coup de gras. I wasn't, I just hadn't found it yet. Right. So if you go down to, if you go down to, are you, are you on there yet? I'm, I'm right there, yeah. Okay, so 104.2B. Okay. which is my, my house would be considered a single family owner occupied dwelling. Okay. So, so it says the single family owner occupied dwelling will not be re re routinely inspected by the code official, but will be inspected upon the filing of a written complaint as set forth in the code. When the code official has a fit has knowledge of specific conditions that warrant inspection or upon request of the owner or other occupant. The code official will conduct a full inspection of owner-occupied dwellings only with the owner's permission or in accordance with the due process of law upon issuance of a search warrant and or the obtaining of an appropriate court order. Guess what they didn't have? <laughs> Any of that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, uh, and, and you're telling me, so I was, the, 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 so the, the city manager, he's, he's supposed to know all about the codes. Of, oh, he didn't know this. Laura Borzo, the code enforcement officer, didn't know this. Uh, Sam Sam Perry, bless his, bless his heart, the, 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 he didn't know this. So go down 104.3, right of entry. You want me to read that? I'll go for it. So 104.3, right of entry, where it is necessary to make an inspection. Now let's remember again, inspection and search, synonymous terms. In, to inspect is to search where it is necessary to make an inspection to enforce the provisions of this code or whenever the code official has reasonable cause to believe that there exists in a structure or upon a premises, a condition in violation of this code, the code official is authorized to enter the structure or premises at reasonable times upon the consent of the owner, agent, or occupant, or upon issuance of a search warrant to inspect or perform. Didn't have it. They, uh, I, I don't see how they're getting away from this. Uh, that's another. So not only did they not follow the, so they create, they make up their own code, which they can't do. They misapply this made up code that then they don't even follow the misapplied made up code. It's, it's a comedy of errors that, you know, Hey, thanks city of Oxford. You guys are idiots. And, and sadly this happens to, almost every municipality across the nation they just all the time all think they can do what they want and we are all dumb dumbs that doesn't know anything and for large part that's true it's true but uh, there's a lot of restraint for government and these municipalities it will just take the time to look yep yep and and re read the charter read your read the city's charter uh, read their codes and ordinances, familiarize yourself with the statutory construction, the judicial canons that you and Brandon have put together, the municipal word document, you know, they're, they're, know your constitution, obviously. So that's another thing that just, just to let you know, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I have 10%, I have 10% here and I'm needing to, 
get going within about 10 minutes or so. Yeah, but that's... we need to we need to form a foundation, obviously. And, and that starts with jurisdictionary. I do believe that that's that's where it starts. But it also starts with our Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers and the Constitution, just knowing these things, knowing how to it, it pains me a little bit seeing how many people just run out there onto the battlefield without knowing how to wield a sword or with no, without knowing how to dodge a, a blow from your opponent. We, we yeah. need to, but yeah. as much as I encourage and want to see more lawsuits filed, we need to, we, we can't be going out Athens there willy nilly. But, but you need, you need uh, re- to be reserved in a lot of areas, you know? Yes. Before and we also need to be forward. paid. Absolutely. We also, I would, we also need to be patient. Uh, we can't be blasting off motions to strike after the, the most, it, we need to like, it's going to be a slow process. It's a grind. It sucks. I understand Alphonse's point. And, you know, where does it say that they get to just sit on these motions to dismiss? I, I get that, but we're not going to twist these ju- judges arms to make them rule any faster. Unfortunately, now we, we did do that in Mississippi, um, Southern district of Mississippi. Southern District of Mississippi, uh, Judge Daniel, um, sitting on whatever, and he hadn't made any rulings. So we emailed his clerk and said, this is theft of services. Mm. Theft of services that you, we paid for services from this court, yeah. and we're not getting any. And he immediately made a ruling. Now, it wasn't what we wanted to hear. <laughs> But he sent us to tribal court, but he he got right off the pot yep. and, and made a ruling. So there are ways, sure. but yeah. it, it's not always advantageous. But we were going to yeah. get that anyway, so we, we might as well move forward. You know? Make it, let's go. Yeah, right. yeah. Right. So I, I've had, I, I, I haven't had to, I think the longest I had to wait was six weeks for my magistrate's oh my rec- report and recommendation. I've had it easy, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you guys want to have some fun, though, if you want to have some fun, look up Magistrate Likovitz Pablo Escobar Hippopotamus. So she granted she's been she's the first federal judge or judge, as far as I know, in the entire country ever to grant animals rights. So she granted some ridiculous filing. Uh, She granted (laughs) hippos are legal people. (laughs) Yep. She granted personhood. Federal protected personhood to Pablo Escobar's hippos because I didn't know this. It's a cool story. Pablo Escobar had hippopotamus down in Colombia, and okay. once his drug, once his drug kingpin world fell apart, these hippopotamus roamed. They're, they they escaped or whatever the hell happened, and now they're like there's no predator. They're in the rivers of Colombia and are just wreaking havoc on the ecosystem. There's nothing. There's no known predator at all. So they're just hippos. Pablo Escobar's hippos are just, you know, wow. creating more hippos. Wow. And so now the, the government of Colombia is like basically given free reign to kill them uh, because they're an invasive species. And yeah. there there was a federal complaint filed by some probably from the city of Oxford. I don't know. And, and they they so judge magistrate judge Karen Likovitz granted personhood to uh, these hippos. So in my in my one of my filings in the mass gathering case, I put a judicial notice that said, uh, apparently, you know, from my logical deduction that magistrate judges and federal judges in the Southern District of Ohio equate we the people's rights with that of Pablo Escobar's hippos, because they, they they're basically we're all we're all persons, you know, we're, I'm, it's oh, just it was a little yeah, i yeah. maybe shouldn't have said it but uh yeah. i couldn't resist so that's yeah. my so people she's my are mag- hippo, hippos so i'm gonna she's that, might, just, that might be the uh, title of this uh video I know, <laughs> hippos and, and, are I, people I, hippos are people my friend yeah <laughs> so and and i also said uh instead of saying the elephant in the room i said the hippo in the room <laughs> so nice i i i i i, I used it yeah. a little bit more yeah, so than, Getting back to the foundations, yeah, Brandon and I are going to start putting together simple, basic courses, you know, and, and step by step what you need to read, what what you should be looking at and studying to uh, if you want to start this. But we're also yep. going to go into some more complex stuff eventually. But um, we're, we're going to do our yep. we'll do what we can to to bring everybody that wants to come uh, along. But yeah. 
And once again, for those of you, you know, I'll give you the last one. For those of us in the Telegram group, I'm not trying to rush anyone out there, but we need we need more we need more of you in federal court. We need you filing lawsuits. We need you picking fights. Grow your grass out. Read your read your municipal code. You know, find do something that that maybe will get them to violate your rights because that they will do it in a heartbeat. And we just we need more of we need more of us. Is pick my some, call. Pick something safe that you feel comfortable with it, like you with the grass, yep. and go after them. Yep, exactly. Uh, super cool talking to you man it's i I, i've been looking up to you guys you and brandon for quite some time and it's it's a real privilege here and i I look forward to you know continuing our friendship yeah i think i think you've surpassed some of us i mean look look, all the (laughs) knowledge you could lay down today so uh, well i'm 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 obsessed with this we're we're pulling for you and anything we can do of course and we want to have you back here real soon but thank you for taking the time Thank you guys. Appreciate it, Gary. All right. Have a good one.